And now, taxi industry stakeholders. So maybe you could uh, each state your name and organisation and interest in the inquiry, please. Sure. Uh, my name is John uh, Vlasopoulos. Uh, I started off as a, as a taxi driver in this industry back in 1983. Um, I represent Ambassador Taxis, which is a holder of uh, conventional licences. It's a holder of M50 or Watt licences. It's also uh, a fleet operator. It's also an assignee of licences. My name is Jim Sigovitsis. Um, we operate uh, taxi staff and services in Richmond. I'm representing the taxi industry stakeholders of Victoria. Um, so. Thank you. My name's <coughs> Ross Walker. Um, I'm a consultant to um, public transport, economist by background. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, we have your submission, but I invite you to. Sure, uh, sure. Uh, one thing I forgot to know, well, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, yeah, Professor Phelps. Uh, I'm the President of Taxi Industry Stakeholders Victoria, which is probably what you were alluding to before. Yeah? Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. uh, would you like us to commence? Or? Yep, okay. sure. All all right. Right. I think it's important, first of all, uh, because we're in relatively new, and the question's been asked before, you know, who we are and what we re represent. Uh, we're, we're, let me get my glasses, because I can't hardly read. Pardon me. Okay. We represent 4,000 drivers, part-time, casual, full-time, owner-drivers, uh, 1,430 operators, uh, owner-operators, uh, small to large fleet operators, 1,350 licence holders, so, uh, a lot of whom are owner-drivers, two secondary networks, two primary networks, uh, and they're Platinum and uh, Danon Taxis, five uh, taxi licence brokers, and indeed two of the larger traders being uh, A and B and uh, Alex Taxi Brokers, and three others, and 550 hire car operators. Uh, TISV welcomes the opportunity to contribute and make meaningful reforms that will change and strengthen the quality and image of the tax industry. Uh, TISV requirements are to set the tax industry in a direction of constant improvement uh, with an overriding focus on customer service excellence, together with customer and driver security and safety. Uh, TIS3 requires any reforms to instill confidence to the consumer and the industry and to underpin uh, the financial certainty and security of all tax industry stakeholders. We propose that all reforms, proposals and changes are to occur without an increase in current numbers of taxis and hire cars. As inquiry statistics show, there is already an oversupply of 1,000 to 1,500 taxis during the daylight hours and 500 to 700 taxis during the midnight hours throughout the week, excepting Friday and Saturday night, for about two hours. Uh, TISV proposed that reforms first look at increasing the quality and productivity of taxis on Friday and Saturday nights, rather than increasing the number of taxis to cater for spikes in demand. TISV also proposed a controlled hybrid approach using existing hire cars, working through safe taxi ranks to address shortage issues on pre-identified peak nights where we may have 100 to 300,000 people in the CBD. Uh, I'm making some broad remarks, then I'll get into the 12 specifics uh, uh, of the reforms that we advocate. Uh, the current poor financial status of industry and implied link to quality. Now, the poor financial status of the tax industry is reflected in 2011 figures. 28% occupancy across the week. 113 jobs per taxi across the week, 24-7. 0.67 jobs per taxi uh, per hour. Taxi earnings, gross, including GST, of $16 uh, dollars, uh, per hour. Uh, the year average earnings. Uh, driver and operator income, and I stress we, we focus on the driver and we must also focus on the operator, income down to $8 to $13 per hour as a year average. Compared with 1985, 42% occupancy, 161 jobs per week, and 0.96 jobs per hour. And in, in terms of any reform, we should circle that 0.96 jobs per hour. That's the highest demonstrated occupancy we've ever had in the tax industry at 0.96 jobs per hour. Now, there are three external Apart from the industry, industry reasons, there are three external predominant reasons for the demise of the tax industry and the current poor financial status. And we, we, I'm, I'm stating facts rather than blame. Uh, now, since 1985, the government has introduced 1,373 taxis in a non-quantitative manner and 2,401 hire car vehicles or quasi-taxis as of right across the counter. That's a total of 3,774 vehicles, total increase in demand, uh, sorry, in supply. The demand is not kept up with, with the numbers. Uh, two, subsidised public transport has doubled 
and I'm talking about subsidies to public transport and public transport, doubled in the last 10 years. Um, the bureaucracy has tripled, and obviously, in terms of comparing price uh, of taxis uh, versus a public transport, with that huge support from the government, uh, there has been movement between taxis and uh, public transport. Three, and I think this is one of the most important issues, the government or ESC control of the fare structure and model. Private business costs and prices its own services and products and moves as required according to market forces and competition. Right? Private industry has control over costing. Uh, rather than allowing the tax industry to innovate by setting its own fare structure and models, as is allowed in the hire car industry, as is allowed in airport bus transfer, the government and ESC has held full control on the taxi fare structure and model, which is now one-dimensional, uncompetitive and inappropriate for our times. We need to look at the bottom line fundamentals. An oversupply of taxis and hire cars leads to the jobs per hour going down, the average fare going down, the unpaid kilometres going up, creating a three-way loss effect, which also impacts directly on safety and quality. TISV maintain that any reform must provide the tools and conditions to preserve and increase the jobs per hour and to preserve or increase the value of the average taxi fare and hence viability and quality of service. These are the <coughs> fundamentals. Uh, we advocate 12 main points of reform uh, uh, towards the industry. Uh, that is in our uh, submission. Uh, the first <coughs> and, and the most important one is to establish a taxi task force. There's a requirement for strong and ongoing taxi industry involvement, communication and representation with government, uh, with inquiry, with government, with the TSC, in tackling and solving all industry-related issues uh, and problems as they arise. Uh, not waiting five years to address them. The tax industry must have detailed and meaningful input to all proposed major reforms at all times. TISV recommends that the TSC, when established, adopts a sharp, corporatised private sector approach of response, with monitoring, collection of complete data sets, the conducting of proper financial and statistical analysis, with the result being quick corrective actions to rectify all industry issues and problems as they arise. Two, establish a culture of customer service excellence from the ground up. TISV to work and the industry, tax industry to work with the government to establish the, and implement new quality standards such as ISO and Jim here is, is exemplary of that with ISO standards throughout his fleet at every level of the tax industry, drivers, operators, networks, even the regulators and properly cost this, properly cost quality into the fair structure. All right? Uh, quality measures will be formally driven by the whole tax industry first. They've got to be driven by the whole tax industry first with the support from the TSC <coughs> and will replace the failed accreditation system. Three, retain and enhance the public interest test for taxis and use a quantitative taxi licence release formula with triggers and parameters to identify the number and types of taxis and licences required at any time. Canberra and Brisbane have good working examples. Lack of financial modelling, potential irrational decision making by drivers, together with low population, low urban density and high car ownership in Melbourne, implies we are not ready for open entry as yet. In fact, all public, public transport in Melbourne is insolvent and subsidised by government due to low use and demand by the public and due to the high car ownership predominantly. Four, TISV do not support release of PBOs and will require a hold or cap of higher car licence to current numbers and reintroduction of the public interest test for hire cars, if necessary. The exorbitant amount of touting and oversupply of hire cars at present needs to be controlled before any changes are made. Five, cap all taxi licence assignments to fair and reasonable value levels. Uh, the taxi licence assignment is not an arbitrary number, but represents the net taxi operating profit of total income, less all expenses and management fees before income tax to the taxi operator. This should be the equivalent or marginally less for the taxi licence holder. Licence assignments must be capped by not increasing taxi numbers. TISV recommends one methodology of making available permits to operate to assignees at the cap value across the counter. On this basis, the taxi licence assignment will be capped to the permit value and should be indexed according to fare increases or set quantitatively, quantitatively uh, by the TSC uh, on an annual basis subject to the above formula. So it can go up or down subject to the above formula. Another scenario to consider would be to return to pre-1983 where we abolish all licence assignments and return to the methodology of operation of all taxes under a management. This would be a far better outcome for the industry and public than open entry. TISV do not agree with 20,000 per annum capping, with capping to be placed at 2,200 to 2,500 at maximum 
and varied according to the earnings formula. Ross Walker, our independent economist, in fact, our, economist, uh, our personal inquiry into the industry, advocates $2,000 per month. So we have that variance. We can talk about that during uh, discussion uh, times. Uh, six, peak service licences. Uh, peak service licences should not become 24-hour licences and impact the day shift. I quoted before, there's 1,000 one to 1,500, depending on the day, on, uh, um, oversupply on the day shift. That's, that's a predominant reason. Uh, we can use another approach uh, where uh, that can be off-road Sunday to Wednesday and on-road Thursday, Friday and Saturday night, and we can pro-rata the NSP fees and registrations and other costs accordingly. Uh, this will address oversupply of 600 taxis during the week and will give the tax industry a fair increase by dec decreasing tax numbers. And those sort of approaches should be examined first. Uh, at minimum imposed condition, all peak service licences are driven by the lessee of the licence. Uh, seven, one of the most important areas, the fair restructure. The funding of drivers, operators, all industry stakeholders, and the delivery of quality is all through an effective fare model. We do not support a capped maximum fare, as this again constrains the taxi industry, uh, depending on what that level is. TIS fee refutes statements that the Melbourne public are paying 30% too much for taxis, taxi fares. Taxi licence assignments or licence interest components have never been part of the uh, fare structure. It, it was the ESC in 2008 that introduced the $20,000 per annum licence as a weighted component of the CIPI formula. And indeed, um, uh, it was 21.7% of the total, and that included network fees, office miscellaneous and base fees, and licence fee. TISV proposed a removal of the ESC imposed $20,000 licence fee from the fare formula. So we're, we're going one step further. We're saying let's remove it. Let's remove the $20,000 from the licence fare formula and allow taxi licence to find their own value subject to market forces. The public has never paid for the taxi licence and the TISV certainly don't want to impose this on the public going forward. Uh, in the fare setting model, we need to become more serious about driver earnings and quality and costs. I don't think that we've ever been serious about driver earnings. It's never been costed properly in the fare model. So TISV proposes that driver earnings, we introduce proper costings of drivers at $17 to $34 per hour, depending on shift loadings, and we cost in penalty rates from 7 p.m. to 5 a.m. in the fare costing model. We revisit and account for proper input costs for total quality taxi vehicle operations. So we're saying total quality taxi vehicle operations in the fare setting model. This may result in a split of 75% to the driver uh, that we support provided that it's properly costed in and the focus is proper costing. The 60% split, we do not support under the current fair setting model as, is, as, as it is unsustainable from day one. It leads to $164 per week loss, including GST for the taxi operator. The 60% must be costed in and cannot be funded by the marginal $1.17 per hour as proposed by reducing assignments from $30,000 30, a year to $20,000. So if we reduce assignments from $30,000 to $20,000, it's $1.17 an hour, quite significant for the operator, but insignificant for the driver, and it's not neutral. Uh, we suggest the tax inquiry visit this and conduct their own cash flow modelling with 60% and input costs. Now, at 4,336 taxis, uh, at 50%, we're around $121 a week, including GST, is your profit margin. If you add another 450, you're losing, at 50%, you're losing $2.42 a week, minus $2.42. At 60% an operator, at 4,336 taxis, the current setting, and I'm not talking about increase in hire cars, we're losing $164 a week from day one. If you add another 450 taxis, we're losing $261 from day one. It's unsustainable. Um, we go on. We propose that any additional income to the driver must be costed in and given to the driver via, via the meter as a percentage surcharge, whilst maintaining the 50% income split between driver and operator as is done on, the, on the Friday and Saturday nights. You could have a 20% surcharge, you could have 10% surcharge, you could have a 30% surcharge, and that goes directly to the driver, but you maintain that 50-50 model. Fuel levy. We require significant costs. We require a responsive fuel levy to in, introduce a separate fuel levy that cannot, can follow spikes up or down in fuel prices, and we need instantaneous decisions and implementation. Uh, and this can be added or subtracted from the fare box through the meter. Now, Lastly, we require a multifaceted and multidimensional approach to fares. Uh, we need to introduce a sophisticated fare st uh, structures of multiple hiring, zone fares and set price fares. And also, we, within that, we introduce a variable metered fare rate within a tariff based on, kilom on kilometres below the, and above the average fare and reducing in rate for long uh, range fares. Uh, an example that we came up with to promote competition Right? Without increasing numbers is this, you know, a three tariff structure for instance. I'm not saying it's the only solution, there's many solutions to explore it and debate it. 
Now, uh, what we have, and the idea of this, it creates competition within taxis, and it creates competition between taxis and the private motorists, uh, between taxis and the hire cars, between taxis and other forms, all other forms of tra transport, uh, uh, bus transport. So tariff one could be set by the ESC, rank and hail, M40, M50 work, including pre-booked M40 and 50 work. And that's set by the government at whatever rates you choose to set it by, and we'll follow that. Tariff two is pre-booked only. And the primary networks can set that. Silver Top can compete against 13 cabs and uh, Platinum and anyone else who chooses to be a primary network. Tariff 3 can be set by an individual operator, a secondary network, um, uh, ambassador taxis, taxi staffing, anyone that chooses, chooses that to compete. That's a Tariff 3. So therefore we have a three-way competition within the industry. We also have the ability of the industry to compete against the hire cars and the airport buses by charging $30 to go to the airport if they have to. Uh, so that's what we propose there. Uh, TISV also proposes another model, and that's a public transport model. And if you look at the 28% occupancy, I think you uh, uh, may reason why. So uh, the public transport model is similar to a bus transport, where all the taxi earnings are paid to the government. The taxi operators are paid a kilometre rate. It may be $1.40 per travel kilometre or less, uh, whatever we calculate it to, but it's got to be a travel kilometre. Then the drivers are paid award rates, or close to. Uh, Eight, licence values. The growth in value is 8.2% compound from 1985 to 2011, not 16% as reported in the media. TISV has used Deloitte Access Economics, who have valued licences at $175,000 post-taxi inquiry reforms. And Ross will uh, elaborate on that. We believe it uh, will be much worse due to the lack of certainty, security and demand and trend towards 100,000, maybe even worse. TISV licence holders are concerned about cash or home equity losses of 50% and loan recalls from lending financial institutions with a requirement of new cash or equity injection to secure the new residual licence value. The flow-on effect of this will be national because banks will move to revalue licence on the Gold Coast, Brisbane, Tasmania, Perth and it's going to have profound effects, particularly if we can quarantine the licence out of the fair uh, model as we suggested. Uh, and has, as has always been. Um, licence value has no relation to taxi fares or hire costs, as is evidenced by hire cars. We've got hire cars charging $180 uh, 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 for one kilometre trip or two kilometre trip with a $2,000 licence and a $30,000 25-year-old car. And we can give many, many examples of this, uh, even with regular hire cars. Um, nine, we support the establishment of the CBS for wheelchair taxi client, clients. Um, this may also be dedicated to a subsidiary of the NSP. The previous CBS that was introduced by the Kenner government and, and was successfully operating uh, was immediately disbanded by the new incoming government. So we've got to depoliticise certain things. I was the director of the CBS, I wasn't involved financially, but it was a very quick move by the incoming government and I'm not having a go, it doesn't matter what government it is, we can't, we can't put things, uh, uh, measures down and then governments change hands and all of a sudden they just uh, quickly undo what the previous government has done for, it must be for good reasons. Uh, Ten driver uh, training, uh, we, we propose to create an option of online training uh, to keep the courses as going if required. Uh, the people can select which module, modules they, they want to select. We agree with the passing of the Knowledge of Melbourne test. I think the one at the moment is quite rigorous, but if we want to enhance that, we agree with that. And to be sat um, uh, at the TSC, as used to be back in the 60s and 70s. Uh, we also propose a hands-on taxi buddy system for the first two weeks of, dr of drivers on the road. Uh, we do not support the 12-month requirement uh, for Victorian driver's licence before application to drive a taxi. This should be on merit and on passing the test. Um, vehicle and safety. TISV supports uniform purpose-built standard taxis or any long wheelbase taxi with a New York style screen. Uh, however, uh, the capital cost of the vehicle, because I ran nine London taxis uh, for about 10 years, uh, so the capital cost of the vehicle, running cost of operation must be properly accounted and costed into the fare structure. 11. Uh, we do support non-mandatory affiliation primary networks for the purpose of promoting competition. However, uh, provided that any alternative doesn't compromise driver or passenger safety. And I think you'll find that uh, uh, when, when you do that, uh, when you have a bit of competition, it, 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 uh, uh, it, it makes people look uh, a, bit, uh, uh, a bit harder. Uh, the 10% surcharge, if this is removed, we support 5% to be given to the driver's fare increase. Um, I'd like to hand over to Ross uh, to talk about the Deloitte's report, if we have time for that. Good. Yeah.
Okay. Um, thank you, John. Yes. Just, um, just before we go into that, um, I'd like to just pick up on a couple of things that um, John has said and just take them a little bit further. The, the, the draft uh, report, the findings of that, you know, seem to indicate that there's a pretty high level of oversupply apart from those peak times, Friday and Saturday nights. Um, a lot of people catch public transport into town on Friday and Saturday nights. And they may catch taxis, but a lot of them get lifts and so forth. They want to have a night out on the town. And public transport generally finishes operating around 2,300 hours. Then we have a shortage of taxis. Um, I think it's more likely driven by the fact that we don't have public transport still operating because it's too expensive for the government to do so. And then we've had a situation over the last 10 years where we've put on a whole lot of peak service cabs and other cabs to try and plug that gap on Friday and Saturday nights, which has really hit the vehicle utilisations for the remainder of the week and pushed down the earnings per cab. And this has impacted right across the scene, into the driver in particular, who's at, the, I guess, the bottom end of the feed chain and the operator, the person that's putting it, it's robbed the, the revenues that were there previously that would allow a reasonable level of profitability. Um, the figures seem to indicate that the profitability in the cab industry is pretty poor at the moment. A lot of operators having to put in money, their own money, to stay afloat, some of the larger operators in particular. And they have the economies of scale to stave off um, you know, the, things, the, the costs increases that, that owner operators don't have because they don't have the economies of scale. I just wanted to make the point that, you know, it seems that we're at a high level of supply, oversupply for most of the week, adding to that burden at the moment um, is something that's very difficult for the industry to deal with when you see, for most of the week, cab ranks full of, full of cabs and um, little in the way of increased growth been happening for a number of years, being observed. We, um, TISV, engaged Deloitte to do some modelling and um, we um, put that in our original, um, sorry, our report to the submission. And we, we had a subsequent meeting with Warwick and Paul last week. And I've had Deloitte do some more modelling following that meeting. And, you know, I'd like to pass on the results of that. But uh, I guess there's two, two findings that they, um, that they uh, came up with that, you know, something that we need to take note of. Um, the relationship between taxi numbers and waiting time. In, in the report, uh, we, we had put a figure there of um, increasing taxi numbers by 5% per annum, which is around 250 cabs, about half the, the level that is targeted in the medium terms, perhaps. Um, we had assumed about that would 1%. It would translate um, um, 1% decrease in waiting time, whereas, whereas um, the, the inquiry had modelled a 5% relationship, a direct, uh, indirect relationship. 5% to 1% in your case, and 5% to 5% in the inquiry, is that what you're saying? Yeah. yeah. Right. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I thought we had a 0.3 factor there. 0.39 was the elasticity. Yeah. Yeah. From the Henshaw work. Yes, yes, and we acknowledge <coughs> that, but it, it was... Um, it, um, I'll, just, I'll just read from the thing here. Um, it is expected that there's a relationship between an increase in the number of taxis and a reduction in waiting time, on average across the taxi market and operating area. 
However, there appears to be little empirical evidence about the strength of the relationship between the two variables. In the Victorian report, it is assumed that, the, that there is a one-to-one -one relationship between taxi number increases and reduction in waiting times. That is, it is assumed that a 1% increase in taxi numbers will result in a 1% decrease in waiting times and that consequently this will result in an increase in the demand for taxis by 0.39%. Um, that's the Henscher elasticity demand. Deloitte have applied this elasticity and the one-to-one -one relationship between taxi number increases and waiting time to, to determine the financial impact of operating a taxi. Assuming fair economic growth and population uh, increases are endogenous variables and using data contained in the taxi review, it is expected that taxi profitability will decline by around $5,000 a year, this is over a five year period, if a 5% annual increase in the number of taxis is implemented, there is a reduction in the annual cost of licences from 30 to 20,000 and driver payments increase from 50 to 60% of the fare box. Based on the modelling undertaken, taxi waiting times would have to decrease by around 13% each year in order to generate sufficient additional patronage to allow taxi operators to break even over the five year period. Um, I'll put obviously submit this to the inquiry. You, you may want to have some further thoughts on it. These, this has come from Deloitte's. The other thing that... It sounds like it was driven by your f assumption that there would be 5% growth numbers. <coughs> um, yes. Well, we had to model on something and we picked a, a mm. figure of 5% because there was figures being mooted at the time that, that the taxi numbers could increase by up to 450. We picked a midpoint of around 250, which is about 5% for modelling purposes. We had to have something to work with and that was perceived to be a non-unrealistic figure um, in year one. Um, so that's just something that's come out of the research. We'd like to submit that to the, to the inquiry. The, the other thing that, that came out was uh, on the discount rate being used on the licences, we obviously, um, Deloitte's used a figure of around 9% and in fact it by an extra 1% for decreases in liquidity. Um, we, you know, we noted that the inquiry was using a, a lesser percentage. Um, and um, I guess regardless of the percentage, they've done some modelling um, that, that basically suggests that if the changes were introduced, the owners of these perpetual licence would lose probably in the order of 200 to 250,000 per licence starting if you start with an average price around 470. That's what the, the modelling has, um, has um, come down to. Um, the extent of the loss would be expected to cause owners some significant financial hardship unless they were to receive some form of compensation and I realise there's various ways they could, uh, that could be addressed. Um, the some of the debt that's associated with these licences might be direct debt over the licence, but in often cases, people that are in business average, often leverage an asset against something else and there can be a domino effect, um, you know, if as a result of, um, you know, a fairly substantial devaluation of assets, it can cause things significant hardship. Um, that's, that's pretty much the Deloitte okay. summary. Um, and I'm happy to table that. It's not a huge document or anything, but that's just some extra findings that we'd like to present back to the inquiry. Uh, what else? What other? The the only other thing that I'd like to um, draw uh, attention can I just to. Ask and you maybe I don't want to interrupt your flow too much. Is there uh, any work on the price elasticity? No. As the general finding of the Henscher work was uh, there's a demand is elastic, a 1% price rise, 1% fall in demand, mm -hmm. which means, uh, well, it, it's a finding that has attracted our interest. 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've done some work on that. Yeah. Okay. But, but we'll talk about that later on. Okay. Yeah. Um, just the other thing, um, and I know it was something that was very difficult for the inquiry to deal with, was the absence of data um, right throughout the process. I, um, I um, obviously could sympathise with you because we we're trying to get data to work on as well, and it was a, a quite a difficult task. Um, we, we had um, assumed that there was a complete data set. Uh, and, you know, our discussions last week were that there was a complete live data set, but the dead running, so to speak, or the in inoperative times wasn't covered in the uh, analysis. Uh, possibly because the information just wasn't available. You know, when a guy turns on his, starts working from the time he turns on his meter, that sort of thing. Um, I, um, that would allow us to have a better idea of, you know, the actual productivity of cabs and the, the, the um, actual operating time versus total operating time um, on the road. Um, apart from that, some of the information um, that, that could be helpful is on, it, on Friday and Saturday nights, it would appear there's about 500 cabs not on the road every Friday night. This is on average, and about 800 cabs on the road not on the road every Saturday night. Now, there's obviously reasons for that, and we, we tried to tie it down to, you know, at a time where it's potentially the most profitable in the week, why would cabs not be on the road? If the sampling of information could actually look at, on average, and do some snapshots as to why, perhaps there could be some information that could flow out of that, um, that could help direct any future cab releases, license releases. For example, if most of them that are not on the road are owner operators, and we're trying to direct licenses, additional issues of licenses, but primarily to owner operators, we need to somehow say, well, if we've got more cabs on the road but they're not servicing a primary shortage time, is that an effective way of growing, that's, it's growing supply? Um, and we, we as the industry, anecdotally, as the uh, tax industry stakeholders group, anecdotally, we tend to think that most of the people that are off the road are, at that time of night are owner operators. They're not the fleet operator type people. Um, but, you know, that, that thing could come out of some survey work that you could perhaps look at. Okay, well, thank you. Well, um, I can see that you've given a great deal of thought to, um, uh, to this and you've come up with a whole lot of uh, very interesting and thoughtful uh, recommendations. Maybe uh, just kicking off on a general note for a minute. Um, um, the, uh, taking the kind of package you've put up as a whole, they've got this idea of setting up a taxi task force, uh, which uh, would kind of work on a whole lot of changes. Uh, at the same time, you want to uh, keep uh, down the number of high <coughs> or PBOs, whatever you call them, and want to limit entry into the industry. And I mean, um, and, and so the solution is kind of a planning solution. Of course, not a market solution. It's a, not a, I mean, I, as you know, I used to run the Competition Commission. It's a very unusual industry. It's very planned. It's, not, it's got all these entry restrictions which don't generally apply in the rest of business in Australia. Uh, so it's not a, not a sort of market competition solution. It's let the industry get together and have a task force and they'll plan it. By the way, I didn't hear the word passenger or customer mentioned during this uh, proposal. So I just wonder, wouldn't it just represent capture right. by the industry of the way the in sure. you know, where it's run yeah. with the passenger, as they say, in the back seat, forgive right. the expression. Yeah. So uh, what do you, what do yeah. you say about well, that? Well, first of all, uh, in my address, I, I said customer several times. Uh, I stand to be corrected here. Yeah, um, so we're very customer, uh, customer focused here. Secondly, um, uh, I'll talk for myself, not TISV. If you want open entry, let me control, like in any other industry, 
the fare box. It is not correct for the government to interfere with our business and control the fare box. If you want me to compete like restaurants do and everyone else, and there are restrictions there, because there's a limited amount of sites, uh, there's a huge amount of capital uh, that has to be put in, and there are restrictions, natural restrictions. Uh, there's ability, uh, there's know-how, technical know-how, and that applies to all industries. Um, we have a problem here. It's been uh, the government uh, uh, created over the last 10 or 15 years. The industry has been abandoned by government. I'm not having a go at them, I'm studying facts. For 10 years, and we've had our fare structure controlled. You give us control over the fare structure, and we're ready to compete with anyone. So uh, you'd have open entry if fares were Personally, I don't care about open entry if I have control about fare structure, whether it's zero, 10,000, 20,000, 30,000. Personally, I'm not talking about the TIS fee. Uh, but at the moment, we've got, uh, we've got people, uh, we've got the industry uh, in a very dire st uh, state, and we've got to pick it up, right? So mm -hmm. what we're proposing mm -hmm. is a transition mm -hmm. period uh, and uh, I think that open entry is incorrect. Uh, we're not London, we're not Tokyo here to have open entry. Uh, we need to uh, transition this. If the population of Melbourne hits 10 million, maybe we can consider it and so forth. That's a different scenario. Uh, but uh, I believe in control. I, I think that we, we're, we're in Australia, we're in Melbourne, we're educated people here. It's all about control. Uh, I did mention about irrational behaviour of, of drivers. That's been exemplified for the last... Uh, uh, last number of years. Uh, we need rational decision making here and business like decisions in the industry. Um, if the industry is so in such dire financial straits, why are people paying half a million dollars right. just for a license? Okay, let me explain that to you. All right, it's a very good answer for that. Uh -huh. uh, if if uh, at twenty thousand dollars a year, if you had the same security as a property, it would be worth $680,000 because the property returns 3%. It's all about security and comparing it to an asset value, right? What's happened is, let me go back to the government again here, all right? And let me explain that to you. In, in the 19, and I'll lead to that, uh, to that answer. In the 1980s, the government sold 300 licences at $60,000 to drivers without interest, right? There's only one driver that's remained that's held that licence. In the 2000, the government valued and sold all the M50 licences directly to drivers. The government valued and sold these directly to drivers. Then in 2006, against industry requirements, it set up the BSX and misled a lot of people and traded license assignments and traded licences as a capital instruments for five years. They continued to put operations in place and, um, uh, and acquiesce in the terms of every time you traded a licence, Right? This get, comes back to security now. Every time you traded a licence, uh, you had to remove a charge from a bank or financial instrument and put a new one. So the government acquiesced in this. So people thought that the instrument was a capital instrument. And so what happened was, instead of comparing to a, a fish and chip shop that might have two times your EBITDA, or another business might be three or four times the EBITDA, or another operation might be six times the EBITDA, people thought it was a capital instrument, comparable to a property. So therefore, your lease was multiplied by 10, 12, lately of 17, right? And if it continues, if the security continues and the return goes down to 3%, it will go up to 34 like a property. And that's why people are paying so much for a licence, because they're comparing it to a property, got up to 17 times the assignment, and that's why, why it's worth so much. Not because of profitability of the industry. Hmm. So, I was going to ask the question, um, what, what, what do you see determines the value of a licence? Uh, because I think the point was made that the licence wasn't, value wasn't related to the price. But you're now Prior ra to raising 19... a number of issues, John, about yeah. what, what determines. Yeah. yeah. Uh, should, pr should, just, yeah. Uh, and one thing there, I mean, should there be considered a link between a house price and a taxi licence? From what you were saying, it sounded no. like you didn't support but, that but, notion. What I'm saying is the government created that, because the government introduced a lease back in 1983-85. I've been in this industry since 1983-85 and I've seen all the transitions. Prior to that, let me tell you, the licence value was more than a house. A house in Brunswick was $12,000, a licence was worth $14,000, right? It's always been more. When the assignments came through, actually licences uh, decreased in value, okay? Um, so what should the link be? There should be no link. We said, that, let's take, the, the argument is not about the licence, the argument is whether the consumer is paying for that licence. Is that so or not? 
I, what I, issue would I, anyone I be know, involved with my their licence was, values? My understanding was when assignments came in, actually mm. licence values actually took no, off even no, further. No, no. Um, uh, when <coughs> when uh, licences were always... Uh, the, the fair model was always based on what a driver would earn, right, and, and cover the cost of the vehicle. There was, there was nothing costed in uh, as far as a licence assignment was concerned or a licence value. It was always based on that. And licences, you go back when they were worth $7,000, you buy a house for $5,000. They were always, uh, uh, always priced accordingly. Um, uh, and people traded that within the, within the market. It was never reflected in the fair structure. Right? And the argument is, it shouldn't be, it's what we're saying, don't reflect it in the fair structure. It doesn't matter whether it's worth $10,000 or $2 million. If the customer's not paying for it, what does it matter? And we're saying, well, uh, instead of flooding the market and not paying attention to the $16 per hour, including GST, which is the real point, not the licence value, um, let's pay attention to that. Right? But I, I wasn't yeah. raising the fair issue yeah. there, but um, just to divert onto the fair issue, I mean, if, if it's the proposition, your, your proposition, you take the licence assignment out of the fair price, yep. doesn't that mean that the fair price would decline by, what, 15%? Well, whatever your costings are. It's part of a very complex formula. I don't care if it declines by 50%, to be quite frank, because we want security. And um, if you use your model, if it declines by 50%, uh, according to your model, or is it the Henschel report, uh, clientele base would, should increase by 15%. Sales will increase by 50%. I, I'm, but, just, um, I'm just using the ESC figures. They said, I think it was 17% of the final price, as they did determined mm. what was made up of the assignment. At 21.7% and it was a, a, a mixture mm. of everything. So I've got to re revisit that if it's 70%. I don't believe so, uh, if that, that's the case. I, I might be wrong in the yeah. figures, but, but anyway, your, your point here is remove that from yep. the fair. Yep. However, and, and the implication is that the fair would go down then. No, it? because we've got no? An, our model is this. We said it's a three-way tariff. And we said do that. But let's look after the driver. $1.17 an hour by reducing $30,000 to $20,000 doesn't do anything for a driver. Right? Let's look at the yearly average, it's $16 an hour. Let's look at the fundamentals. Um, let's look at business properly, you know, what, where the industry is. So we don't agree with that solution. In principle, it's correct. Everything you propose in principle, you know, principally is correct, but the numbers don't do it. If you went down but, to but zero... Just, if I could interrupt, you're, yeah. you're saying take the full assignment out of the price. What we are saying is no, um, in, in, in the draft recommendation was to reduce the assignment price uh, in what, effect to 20000 uh, What I'm saying is that the TISV do not want it, the, the governments in 20 years' time or 30 years' time or financial analysts or economists to come and say that the consumer is paying for the taxi licence. They want to know that they have security. If the licence costs a million dollars or costs $10,000, they need security to invest in that. If they're putting their house up uh, to mortgage their house and lose everything they own, they need security that no government will interfere or no one will interfere saying that the consumer is paying for an assignment. That is the principle behind it. Let me get back to what you're saying. I am saying exactly what you're saying. Take it out like it used to be. However, don't leave the driver and operator out on a limb like, like they have been left uh, uh, with the costing. Go back and cost things properly and cost the driver in at $17 to $34 an hour and cost the, cost the owners in at the appropriate cost. It costs about $10 an hour to run a car including GST, including fuel. Uh, and if you address those costs, it's fine, but then you introduce other measures. There's a tariff two, there's a tariff three. If you want the industry to compete with existing numbers, allow us to compete, right? Uh, and if we do all that, it will work. If we do it, if we go back and take out uh, the assignment cost of 20,000 down to zero, uh, and the EC, uh, um, as I understand it, that still wants full control of the licensing, uh, sticks to one unilateral um, uh, method, then we're, we're all doomed. I can't help but think that you're proposing a much more radical plan of reform in that regard than than we have proposed, uh, which, well, is, which is... Uh, the, the terms of reference are being competition, I understand. Is that right? So my, my, we're here to compete. We're here to compete with everyone. We're here to compete with the private motorists. We're here to compete with the airport buses. We're here to compete with anyone that wants to compete with us. But we've got no control over our fare structure. So what I'm saying is that there's tariff one, Right? And I understand that ESC wants control over the fair structure. So we'll give them control. Let them, if you want to use your elasticity of demands and decrease your rates to 80 cents a kilometre uh, over the average fare, if you want to, uh, in fact, there's a lot of sophistication that goes into the fair modelling. And I was a bit disappointed in the report from that point of view. And we want to be working with, uh, on, on, that, on, that, on that model. Um, 
That's the funding of the industry and that's where we need to get to. So if the EEC does that and costs that in, at whatever they choose to cost it in, they may choose to reduce fares by 30% or 17%, I don't know, uh, on tariff one. Um, what we do is come off of tariff two and tariff three where we're allowed to compete for the pre-booked only um, um, bookings. So allow us to become the PBOs, allow the existing tax to become the PBOs, rather than introducing more PBOs at the moment. We're saying let's, so, let's I, have more competition in the, in the industry as it is before we start looking at introducing more cars. There isn't enough work there for everyone at the moment. So let's do, let's let, let everyone compete against themselves and then we can, uh, we can look at, and as demand grows, we can look at introducing more cars. Yeah. I think it's uh, got to do with system efficiency. Try and get the system working more efficiently and the, all the components, I mean, it's, it's shambolic in places. Get it get it working more efficiently by putting structures in and then start to introduce more supply as and when it's needed. Uh, I think it's a very interesting uh, proposal, but, but, but tell me, what happens to licence values in this proposal? They might go down to $10,000, they might go up to a million dollars, we don't know. Uh, 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 one thing that will happen is the banks, what we don't want is the banks to move in and say that uh, licence values have moved down to $200,000. Because someone has set uh, a value and foreclosed on uh, on 27,000 people around Australia their own licences. Hmm. Yeah. So what we're saying is, licence value is irrelevant. Uh, yeah, uh, let it float. Let the market determine licence value. You know, whatever it is, it is. Uh, what we're worried about, what we're concerned about, is that consumers should not be paying for the licence as they haven't been in the past pre 1983. Um, you know, at best, you go remove assignments, abolish assignments if you want to. You, you, you go back to operation and management. That's one scenario. There's many alternatives. We've put four alternatives down, right? Uh, so uh, that's a case. We also exemplified with hire cars. And um, hire cars, I gave one example, but uh, hire cars have got the ability to charge wherever they want. And if, at the moment, we're earning $1.60 a kilometre, $1.617. A hire car for a local trip will charge $30. The proposed B PBOs, uh, f from one end of the city to the other, I'll be surprised if it's under $20. That's $10 a kilometre. Right? And we're, we're charging $1.60 a kilometre. Yeah? And that's why I raised the, the element of the cap fare as well. Yeah? So we need to control over our costing in, so, in one capacity. So what we're doing is finding the best of two worlds where the ESC controls tariff one and we're controlling the other tariffs through competition. And we're able to compete within ourselves and with anyone else that wants to compete with the taxi industry. And I think that's been a very pertinent point because what you're recommending in the tariffs is just, again, the ESC controls one unilateral, uh, one dimensional uh, structure. So how are we going to compete? How would you compete if you owned a taxi? Uh, you know, how would the inquiry, sorry, I'm not directing uh, at you and so forth. How would the inquiry compete if they owned a taxi for the last 10 years with hire cars or the airport buses or anyone else? So just going through the three again, um, the regulated uh, first category would apply to rank and hail, and what about phone bookings? Uh, M40, f phone bookings only for M40, M50 work, because that's funded by the government and we don't want to interfere with that. Okay. Um, what about, and the third category, the individual operator, yep. what's the story there? Uh, he can charge whatever he wants, of course it's got to be pre-approved. Um, yeah, if you want it that way. I mean, there's two approaches. One you can say is either an open hire car uh, or it's, it's pre-approved. So he can compete against uh, a silver top or one three cabs in the price. He can compete against uh, an ambassador taxi or a cabway or a secondary network. Or if he's part of a secondary network, they can deem to as, as say, well, as a secondary network, we deem this price as a pre-booked price. Yeah, but but yeah. the problem at the moment is where the pricing is, uh, you can't give any discounts, you can't compete, the prices are way too low, there's no money uh, to operate the car, just barely enough to operate the car. Uh, if, we, if we have um, freedom with the fares, then we can actually give a discount, but we can't give a discount at the present rate. Yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot of intelligence to go into that, and that's why I mentioned the average fare. You might have to, uh, you might have to charge $2.80 a kilometre, which no one would feel for the first five kilometres, then take that back, you know, get a bit more uh, intelligent about what you do before and after the average fare and, and break it up in five kilometre uh, uh, slots and you might be down to 60 cents a kilometre uh, for anything above uh, 20 k's or 30 k's. So we need to look at that within the tariffs and we also propose that penalty rates that come back in between 7pm and 5am for drivers to, to give them the incentive of uh, driving on that 
as used to be back in the 80s. Uh, you know. So a lot of work to be done on fears, that's what we see. And, and the report, I suppose the draft report, uh, is clearly favouring more flexibility in fares. Yeah. Uh, we've gone some way, again, you're being more radical, in, mm. in, and uh, that's challenging to think more about it. Uh, flexibility in fares? Well, it depends what the maps, maximum cap fare is. I mean, if, if we're at $1.60 at the moment, mm. see, I don't agree with the current fare structure to start off with. Mm. It's just one, uh, it's one fare. It shouldn't be that way. That's one thing. Mm. Uh, but if, if the maximum cap fare is $1.80 a kilometre, mm. how do we compete and discount? You know, I, I, it, can you give us an indication what, if we're at $1.60 a kilometre, where would the maximum uh, cap fare be, be? Would it be $5 a kilometre, $10 a kilometre? Mm. 20, I don't know, you know. If it's higher cars, PBOs will be charging $10 a kilometre for a local fare. Yeah. Can I, I just raise some other uh, issues? I, I wanted to go back to this question about um, the um, oversupply. Um, and you, you mentioned there have been new cars in the last, new cabs in the last decade and so on. But um, the um, uh, strong... Um, evidence that we've had is that actually demand has collapsed and that's the fundamental problem of this industry mm. that um, we've got poor utilisation of vehicles you know 28 percent was the figure that we had and I think John you referred to 42 percent 42 percent in 1985 yeah. now undoubtedly there's been some increase in supply over that time mm. but but clearly um, the major factor well I'll ask you that question. Uh, a significant factor, at the very least, ha has been a collapsing demand. Yes, and if... um, you know there are a range of factors which have been um, referred to mm. as possible sources of that. Yeah. Uh, not the least of which is the lack of community confidence yes. in the service performance and so on. Yes. Um, there's a gross lack of community confidence uh, um, since the Kennett years. I'm not referring to Jeff Kennett and so forth, but uh, he instilled a lot of confidence in, uh, in the industry. Um, as I mentioned, um, the industry has basically been abandoned for the last 10 years. There's been no attention on the industry whatsoever. Uh, we've got a unilateral price. But let's go back to the heydays of the industry, uh, that, what you mentioned, 85. Different profile of driver, clean car, you know. Uh, knowledge of Melbourne, everything, everything was right. Maximum, and everyone caught a cab. There weren't these 3,773 extra cab, uh, uh, PBOs and cabs on the, on, the, on the road, right? So everyone caught a cab to the airport and so forth. And the maximum recorded jobs per hour is 0.96 jobs per hour. So what do, we, um, what do we base our calculations on? We're at 0.67 at the moment. So the maximum recorded is, is that uh, 0.96 um, uh, uh, jobs per hour. You know, and that's when you had full confidence, you had the clean car, roadworthy vehicle, the owner driver scenario or fleet op operator scenario uh, there. So if we model on the existing fare structure, uh, I believe we have to aim at about $35 an hour to capture. Whether you use our model or your model, or whoever's uh, model, it doesn't matter, the three tariff system or, or, or your model, we need to achieve about $35 an hour to, to pay for the costs and to reward the drivers accordingly around that figure, including GST. Now, so, so that's based on the, on the utilisation as in 85, is that what you're saying? Uh, well, let me get to that. The kilometre thing. Uh, yeah. Thing. Yeah, well, that's, uh, the unpaid kilometres is a different scenario. Yeah, uh, that increases costs. So if we go back to that, let's look at the current fare structure. Um, the, we have to go from 0.67 jobs per hour to 1.85 jobs per hour to get $35 an hour. So the utilisation back then was 0.97. We have to even double that. So we have to go from 26.3 million jobs that you've recorded in your draft report to 78 million immediately uh, to get to $35 an hour. Yeah? So there's fundamental problems there that have to be addressed first. Yeah? Uh, and I think what we're saying is all these have to be addressed first, there has to be a transition period, and then we can look at things. I think, um, John, also the other thing that's caused demand for cabs to drop is, is um, some good and some not so good substitutes. Our high car numbers have doubled, our public transport has increased considerably. Um, airport transfers of, you know, sky bus service is fabulous, you know. Um, airport parking, that has been an explosion, it's been a trend around the nation. 
and there's been discounting and so forth happening on that. And private car ownership is continuing to increase. All those things are just by nature going to impact on the demand for taxis. Right. And, and how has the taxi industry been able to com compete with that, with our fare structure? Set by the government? No change. We have to wait for the government to decide how to set our fare structure. Why not give us the ability? Um, ten years ago, I could have competed with anyone coming on the market. I can compete with anyone coming on the market now. And as TISV, we can, if you give us the flexibility and fare structure. We've got no ability to compete. And we're sitting here five years later uh, with, without a fair change. Not, e not even a fair increase. There's arguments against a fair increase, a 10-10 rule of 10% increase, 10% uh, uh, loss of, uh, of passengers. But how about a restructure? You know, how about some intelligence into this, in, into this fair model? Um, you know, and I would have thought that, that the government would have looked at that rather than waiting five years to get us into this predicament. I mean, one thing that comes through time and time again um, in the taxi industry is the taxi industry seems to be sitting down waiting for someone to do something for it. Um, um, and does this sort of seeming lack of innovation really, re really reflect the fact that um, you know, everything is so tightly <laughs> regulated and controlled um, mm. that we're not getting the opportunity for new players to come in with new ideas, new initiatives, yeah. and so on. This is really a, a strong characteristic of, mm. of this industry. Yeah. Uh, I think I remember Lindsay Fox saying that was a, it was a basket case uh, quite a number of years ago. Um, now, it's going to get worse. Um, as I said, Jim's a, is a prime example. Um, uh, we've been tarred with the same brush. The papers have been on unrelenting uh, reports, denigration of the industry for five years got every single clipping at home and so forth. So it's been progressive, so it's been a loss of confidence there. Uh, Jim runs ISO standards in his fleet. He's a very exemplary operator. You know, We all do different things. We all compete the best way we can within our fleets and we try to do different things. It's like visiting one restaurant and going to another. You get a very good service uh, within that restaurant. And you address those issues, as, as we said. You, you mentioned non-mandatory affiliation, you mentioned secretary networks and so forth. So you address those is issues where we can join those and, uh, and do those to promote our own businesses. But we can't compete on fares, on fair price. So if a, if a PBO or a hire car can charge $25 to go to the airport, uh, we can't. You know? sure. So we need to, to relook at that. Uh, so we can't be innovative. You know? The, the fair modelling is a very crucial part of our industry. Yeah. And uh, the, uh, the tax industry, it's, uh, it, it's, it's all individuals, it's all individual businesses. And it might be a group of drivers that are um, performing fairly well and being denigrated as collectively. You know, I might be running a good show or a bad show. Uh, Jim's running an excellent show, an excellent business. Uh, but we're all being tied to the same brush at the moment. I, th I think what we've got to do is, going forward, we've got to work closely with the government um, uh, with regarding with uh, improvements of the industry, one step at a time. Um, there's probably a few things that we can probably do straight away, um, but we can um, help promote our own businesses as well. Uh, so I think, but as going forward, we've got to be very careful as well, um, and we should do things through pilot programs as well, depending on what the the uh, application is. But we should just proceed cautiously on on certain certain aspects. I think one of the things, just picking up on that, and um, I'm sure the, in the inquiry would agree that we really need to have some good performance measurement tools in place from as soon as possible so we can actually record what's going on because, you know, if that had been in place ten years ago, this could, a lot of the problems may have been corrected five years ago. So it sounds like you're supportive of the idea of... Uh data coming direct from Absolutely. the camps. Absolutely. Absolutely. 100%. I, I think that that is, that is critical because you can't know, even if you make a decision to do something in, a, in the short term, you, it's going on a very good trend and you want to put more or it's going on a not so good trend and you want to address it. You've got no way of monitoring that and we, we would totally support having that data. It's got to happen. Even from the time they turn on the cab, so we've got the dead running stats you know, the proper, and, and we even put it in our, our model about productivity, trying to set up those safe ranks in town, the 12 safe ranks and, and so forth, and having monitors in there to dish people out north, east, south and west. That idea was to put a 40% surcharge like the tax inquiry recommended, 
with the additional going to the driver, but also to get multiple hiring actually working to reduce the requirement of cabs on the night by increasing productivity. Those sort of things, we should be able to record the fact that we've had three or four multiple hirings in the one cab. So you do one journey, but three or four, and actually how many people are in the cab? We should have a proper passenger kilometre statistic. We do it in the bus industry where we actually get passenger kilometres. And it's the ultimate form of measurement of performance. And totally, totally agree, and those things should be going on the metre so we can tell how we're tracking, because we could in fact be carrying a lot more people and not even know it. We might be making more trips, but it's the persons per trip that's a, the best measurement of, of how well the industry is actually doing. I think it's important that we do work off a complete data set and not just um, uh, pick the bits that uh, are there at the moment. Um, if we're a complete data set, then we can make uh, rational decisions. So I just wonder how, that, how far that goes. Um, you mentioned uh, profitability data earlier, yeah. that you, you, you are aware of certain profitability data. And you'll be aware that the inquiry has certainly sought data from um, the industry yeah. um, and uh, has a range of data. We could have more. Yeah. Um, should the regulator in future have uh, detailed knowledge of the financial circumstances of operators in the industry? Well, it's not a secret. Uh, uh, you've got the data. Uh, there's nothing missing um, uh, uh, from that um, at the moment. Well, so from, from the vehicle, I mean, the operational costs should be fairly straightforward. Uh, is, that, is that lacking at the moment? Well, only, uh, only the, the um, non-live data, the dead running sort of statistics and the dead time when the cab's not, not operating. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you had the complete picture of that data, it would certainly allow the ESC and people like that to make better informed decisions and not have to go and do sampling exercises and so forth to try and make an informed decision on how things are tracking. Um, you know, and certainly if that information is complete, it makes the exercise a lot easier, as you would well truly know. Mm. It's, and, um, and TISV doesn't have any problem with that. Uh, in fact, we recommend it. Yeah. It's, uh, it, must be, it must have been a nightmare trying to get, get data. And you know, when, you, when you've not only got to get it, then you've got to attest to the accuracy and the integrity of the data. That's, that's another series of events as well. And people collect data in different ways. Yeah. Um, and if you do it in a uniform format or straight off the machine through the technology, it's, uh, it's easier to process and analyse. Yeah. The other thing is you can feed back information to your drivers and, and you know, back, back to your companies to see how you're performing, benchmarking. Um, you know, if you want to talk about driving competition, if one particular company does things in a certain way and they're getting more jobs per hour and so forth, uh, compared to others, you've got to ask yourself, are their methods better than ours? Have they got a better approach to customer service? How are they doing things? Where are they hanging out? Those sort of things um, become very important in the equation. And, you know, until you get that information at a company level, to some extent, you, you blind, you're flying blind. You know, we need that GPS stuff so we can show the hotspots where the activity is happening and stuff like that. They're, they're the things that should be driving where you go and hang waiting for your next fare. That's where the you know, demand's been um, starting and, and coming and going from at various times. You know, they're very important. Yeah. I, I just wanted to ask something yeah. uh, as well. Uh, uh, I think the modelling shows there's only an increase of 450 taxis uh, predicted for the modelling. Yeah, we disagree with that. But, but um, if that is the case, on a weighted average of 10%, how is that going to change the industry? Um, you know, usually you have to achieve 80 per cent, 80, 20 or whatever it is to change the industry, if that was the case. And also in the mix, uh, an owner-driven cab, an owner would choose to drive five shifts, six shifts a week. He has to give uh, his vehicle to a, another driver to drive uh, the, the other shifts, usually eight to nine shifts. And traditionally that's probably to a student driver. Um, that's the main source of uh, drivers at the moment. Um, so, I, as a quality issue, I, don't, I, just, I just can't see how that will impact on quality. If, if indeed it's 450, um, or would increase up to 450 in taxis, and I'm not talking about PBOs, unless you see the quality coming in through the PBOs and the tax industry um, uh, sliding off to oblivion, um, 
but uh, just on, on those figures. The other thing, the other trend as well is young people tend to expose themselves. I drove on Friday, Saturday night. You know, uh, would I do it now? Probably not. You know, I'd choose to stay at home, whether it made $1,000 or whether I made whatever. Uh, and speaking to a lot of our drivers, once they um, mature, and um, uh, uh, have a family, they choose not to drive. And I would say, on Friday and Saturday night, so I would say that irrespective of the earnings, uh, 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 with your model, that you say that um, uh, you're changing the licensing conditions so people can elect not to put the car on the road, I still say that if 450 came on, on, the, on, the, on the road, or 1,000 came on the road, they'll <laughs> choose to work Monday to Friday, Monday to Saturday uh, day, sh uh, day shift because they're family people, and still let their car out. And the trend we're finding is uh, they're looking at that. If they cannot achieve that, they move off to uh, something else. If the takings are woeful and they go from $16 an hour down to $12 an hour, they'll go and do another job and usually uh, le uh, lease their car out, or, or I suppose if we move to the 60 without re costing it. And we support the 60%, as I said, as long as it's costed in properly, um, and not in the current model because we'll be losing money. So we'd ask you to relook at that. Uh, in terms of costing, from a costing point of view. So there's behavioural uh, pro uh, problems. People behave in a particular way, and you may not be, we're, we're the shop floor, we're the ground floor, uh, and so forth. Uh, and I think you need to look at all these behavioural problems as well. And um, that's why we're opposed to open entry, because uh, there's been an irrational, irrationality in this industry uh, that we've seen in the last seven years from driver groups and, and various groups. Uh, and we certainly don't want to see that going forward, uh, particularly at the state of the industry at the moment. You know? We do want quality, we do want to compete, but we need to have the tools, uh, be supplied the tools uh, to be able to do that, particularly through the fare structure in, in, in particular. I also mentioned you know, capping uh, with permits, not, not increasing the numbers. That's similar to your idea, it's available across the, uh, the bench um, as such, and it's at a cap value of two and a half or, two th or whatever, it, whatever it may be uh, that we decide. Um, so uh, I think that's a very important point at the moment going forward that we cannot afford to increase the numbers um, uh, as such in, in terms of taxis. And we have to address the issues that uh, Ross uh, put forward there. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for your detailed uh, submission and very interesting points. Yeah.